nation remembers. We'll have Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg's lasting legacy on the Supreme Court of the United States. Plus, reaction from lawmakers and the president on the passing of Justice Ginsburg. Replacement battle. The fight to name a new Supreme Court judge intensifies. We'll have analysis. And addressing world leaders. Pope Francis prepares to speak to the United Nations as this year's General Assembly goes virtual. On EWTN News Nightly for Monday, September 21st, 2020. Tributes continue to pour in outside of the Supreme Court of the United States days after the passing of Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, the court's second ever female justice. Her death on Friday night setting up what will be a confirmation fight here in Washington. Good evening and thanks for joining us tonight. I'm Tracy Sable. President Donald Trump on Saturday urged the Republican-run Senate to consider without delay his upcoming nomination to fill the Supreme Court vacancy created by the death of Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. She died just six weeks before the election. The Supreme Court announced Justice Ginsburg died of complications from metastatic pancreatic cancer at the age of 87. Ruth Bader Ginsburg's rise from this humble Brooklyn home to the nation's highest court is a classic American story. She was smart, died for first in her class at Columbia Law School, but in the late 50s and early 60s, the glass ceiling stood firm. She turned to teaching law and fighting gender discrimination for the ACLU. In 1980, Ginsburg became a federal appellate court judge. Thirteen years later, she was named to the Supreme Court by President Bill Clinton. She was only the second woman on the bench. The first was Sandra Day O'Connor. As a justice, Ginsburg consistently voted in favor of abortion access, same-sex marriage, and civil rights. Perhaps her best-known work on the court, writing the 1996 landmark decision to strike down the Virginia Military Institute's ban on admitting women. She was also known for her dissents, including when the court stopped the 2000 Florida ballot recount, when the court decided on a section of the Voting Rights Act, and when the justices ended the contraception mandate for some businesses under the Affordable Care Act. After Justice John Paul Stevens retired in 2010, Ginsburg became the most senior of her liberal colleagues, but she didn't slow down. Ginsburg hired a trainer after treatment for colorectal cancer in the late 90s. In 2018, doctors treating the justice for broken ribs discovered a cancerous growth on her lung. Her best friend on the bench was the late Justice Antonin Scalia, her ideological opposite. Once asked how we could be friends given our disagreement on lots of things, Justice Scalia answered, I attack ideas, I don't attack people. Some very good people have some very bad ideas. <laughs> Justice Ginsburg is survived by two children, four grandchildren, and one great-grandchild. On Saturday morning at the Supreme Court, her usual seat was draped in black. Justice Ginsburg will lie in state at the Supreme Court on Wednesday and Thursday. And House Speaker Nancy Pelosi announced that Justice Ginsburg will lie in state in the U.S. Capitol on Friday. A private internment service will be held next week at Arlington National Cemetery. Supreme Court Just Chief Justice John Roberts released a statement on the passing of Justice Ginsburg, saying, quote, Our nation has lost a jurist, jurist of historic stature. We at the Supreme Court have lost a cherished colleague. Today we mourn, but with confidence that future generations will remember Ruth Bader Ginsburg as we knew her, a tireless and resolute champion of justice. Meantime, on Capitol Hill, Democrats are comparing this Supreme Court vacancy with the one in 2016, also a presidential election year. They say GOP leader Mitch McConnell refused to confirm a nominee then, and he should wait again now. Capitol Hill correspondent Eric Rosales reports. Eric? Well, that's right, Tracy. Republicans are pushing back, but unlike four years ago, uh, actually there was uh, this time an incumbent in the White House, an incumbent who actually could get reelected. And unlike four years ago, Republicans have control of the Senate and the White House, but that's still not stopping Democrats from pushing back. The stakes could not be higher 
Democrat Adam Schiff says the eight remaining Supreme Court justices can handle the court's workload for now. The Supreme Court is going to decide uh, whether we have the Affordable Care Act. Uh, that argument's going to be heard right after the election. But that court will also decide uh, whether to overturn Roe v. Wade. Republican Senator Ted Cruz argues a vote needs to happen before the election because, quote, Joe Biden has said if he doesn't win, he's going to challenge this election. He's going to court. And in a statement shortly after Ginsburg's death was announced, Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell said in part, quote, President Trump's nominee will receive a vote on the floor of the United States Senate. She has lived the life that Justice Ginsburg fought for women to be able to live. Catherine Glenn Foster, president of Americans United for Life, points to the qualifications of one front runner, Amy Coney Barrett, a Catholic who in 2017 went through the confirmation process for her spot on the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals. Her scholarship, her legal writings, everything that she has done in this sphere indicates that she is ready. She is ready to join our nation's highest court. Whoever the president picks will face fierce opposition. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi said Democrats have arrows in their quiver still to be used, and she's not rolling out impeachment. And Senate Democratic leader Chuck Schumer said Democrats will increase the number of justices on the Supreme Court if they win control of the Senate. Once we win the majority, God willing, everything is on the table. It's important to note that since 1880, that's a long time ago, there's only been 16 Supreme Court vacancies before an election day in presidential election years, and no Senate has ever confirmed an opposition party's nominee. Now, the last time that it was tried was in 2016, when then Vice President Joe Biden wanted the Senate to actually confirm Merrick Garland. That was President Obama's pick to the U.S. Supreme Court. It never happened. Tracy? Okay, thank you so much, Eric. Correspondent Eric Rosales reporting from Capitol Hill tonight. President Donald Trump said this morning on Fox News that he will reveal his pick for the Supreme Court on Friday or Saturday. His list is down to four or five finalists. White House correspondent Owen Jensen reports. Owen? Tracy, President Trump wants a confirmation vote before Election Day, that day, of course, moving in fast. His Democratic rival, Joe Biden, has a different take on when it should happen. She just died? Wow. I didn't know that. I just, uh, you're telling me now for the first time. President Donald Trump finding out about Ginsburg's death from reporters after a Minnesota rally Friday night. She led an amazing life. What else can you say? She was an amazing woman. Whether you agreed or not, she was an amazing woman who led an amazing life. Fast forward just a few days, and the president has narrowed his list of candidates to fill the vacancy. I will be putting forth a nominee next week. It will be a woman. It will be a woman. One contender is Amy Coney Barrett, a federal appellate judge and a Catholic. Barrett is thought to be at the top of his list of favorites. And also being considered, appellate court judge Barbara Lagoa of Florida. And there's Allison Jones Rushing, a 38-year-old appellate judge from North Carolina. Meanwhile, Democrat Joe Biden made a televised plea to the Senate to hold off on moving forward right now with the confirmation process and wait until a new president is elected. Don't go there. Uphold your constitutional duty, your conscience. Let the people speak. Cool the flames that have been engulfing our country. President Trump is in Ohio tonight for another campaign event. No doubt he'll be talking about the Supreme Court. There are 43 days to go until Election Day and eight to go until the first debate. Tracy? White House correspondent Owen Jensen reporting for us tonight. Thank you so much, Owen. And joining me now on Skype to talk more about all of this is Tim Carney, senior political columnist for The Washington Examiner and resident fellow at the American Enterprise Institute. Tim, welcome back. Always good to see you. Before we talk about the political battle, I'd like to take note of Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg's life and her judicial career. Your thoughts? Well, people use the word giant. People call her a trailblazer. These are all absolutely true. She wasn't the first. She was the second uh, woman on the Supreme Court. Uh, she served for over 20 years and uh, rallied lots of people. She became—when the Democrats lost the White House after 2016, 
uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg kind of became the icon for the, the Democrats, especially uh, the liberals over there. She was their most powerful figure and really carried not just one seat on the Supreme Court, but a real symbolic value uh, for women in this country and especially for Democrats. Yeah, and soon after her passing, as you know, the political battle ensued with Democrats vowing to fight. What do you think of the process, Tim, and do you think it's being rushed? Well, Ginsburg herself was confirmed 42 days after she was nominated. We are approximately 42 days from Election Day. The idea that, you know, uh, that months from the new president coming in, and if, if Trump loses, Biden wouldn't come in until January 20th. The idea that you can't get a confirmation done in that time isn't really based in history. It's based, as Biden was saying, in the fact that sort of tensions are very high right now. That said, what Biden is asking Republicans to do is actually not do their job, not do their job of advising and consenting and confirming or rejecting a nominee. So it's, it's certainly not a rush. It just, it's coming at a time when political tensions are particularly high. That as an argument to sort of possibly hand the ball over to Democrats is not one that's sinking, is convincing very many Republicans at all. Yeah, the president has said uh, that he plans to announce his nominee by the end of the week. Let's talk about the significance of the pick, especially given the issues and the cases before the high court. What's at stake here, Tim? Well, if we look at the political aspect of it, a lot of people, a lot of liberals are, Democrats are hoping that they're going to rally the suburban female vote with a possible threat to Roe v. Wade. Um, and if you just poll people on Roe v. Wade, it's popular. If you poll people on the specific, uh, what Roe v. Wade actually means, that is, should states be allowed to pass some laws to protect protect the unborn, at that point, Roe v. Wade becomes less popular. And Amy Coney Barrett, for instance, is herself a suburban mother. So when we look at the political aspect of it, anybody who really tries to predict how this will cut, um, it's they're, they're going way out on a limb. We don't have enough information on that. But of course, this isn't just about politics. It's about the future of the court. Um, a Louisiana state law on abortion was uh, just struck down by a 5-4 majority with the four liberals and and, uh, and Chief Justice Roberts, you throw in a pro-life judge who's not as attached to sort of stability and, and precedent as, as Roberts appears to be, and you could actually start to expand protections for the unborn. Well, as we've seen, and as mentioned, emotions are running high on both sides. How do you think this will play out with voters, Tim? And, and how do you think it will affect both the Republicans and the Democrats ahead of the November election? Well, to some extent, this increasingly makes the election about abortion, and the way that abortion polls in this country is pretty complicated. The majority of voters say they don't want Roe overturned, but when you ask them specifically, should states be allowed to regulate abortion or ban it later in the pregnancy, most people do say yes. Democrats are hoping that this will sort of rally suburban women, which is a swing population, over towards uh, their side and away from Republicans if Roe v. Wade becomes a centerpiece. On the other hand, you do have uh, you do have the fact that Amy Coney Barrett, who could be the nominee, is herself a suburban mom. And if Democrats are attacking her, then uh, Republicans are hoping that that will look bad for them. The fact is, this is nearly unprecedented. Nobody knows exactly how it will play politically. Well, Tim, thank you so much for coming on. We always appreciate your analysis. Tim Carney, senior political columnist for The Washington Examiner and resident fellow at the American Enterprise Institute. Thanks again, Tim. Thank you. Coming up, President Donald Trump considers several women for the Supreme Court, including Judge Amy Coney Barrett. Our next guest says Barrett is already getting attacked just because she's Catholic. We continue with more coverage on Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg and the void left now on the high court, one that could potentially be filled by a Catholic woman.
Joining me now on Skype to talk more about Justice Ginsburg's legacy and the road ahead is Robert George McCormick, professor of jurisprudence and director of the James Madison Program in American Ideals and Institutions at Princeton University. Robbie, welcome back. Always great to be with you. Uh, first, I'd like to begin with your reflections on Justice Ginsburg. Well, Justice Ginsburg uh, was the anchor and often the driving force on the left side of the uh, Supreme Court. Uh, she played the role uh, opposite to that of Justice Antonin Scalia, who was uh, not only her ideological adversary, uh, but her good friend, who was the anchor and very often the driving force on the right side of the court. Uh, her judicial philosophy uh, was to try to advance through the law causes she believed in, progressive causes she believed in. Women's equality was the cause she began her career advancing. She did that as a lawyer. Uh, working, for example, as a lawyer with the American Civil Liberties uh, Union, a left-wing advocacy uh, organization. She was uh, later, after being a successful litigator, including in the Supreme Court, uh, made a judge of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia Circuit. There's where she became close to Justice Antonin Scalia, Judge then Antonin Scalia, who was serving on the same court, despite their uh, political differences. Then, of course, eventually both were uh, elevated to the Supreme Court of the United States where they uh, continued to uh, oppose each other jurisprudentially and politically, even as their friendship blossomed. I know there's great political debate going on right now. What should happen next? President Trump says that he plans to announce a female nominee to fill that vacancy at the end of the week. What are your thoughts as we watch this all play out? Well, I think what will happen is that the president will make his nomination. The Senate will then count noses. <laughs> Senator Mitch McConnell, uh, the leader of the Republicans, the leader of the majority, will count noses and see if he thinks he has the votes to confirm the president's nominee before the election. If he does have the votes, I don't have the slightest doubt that he will do it. If he fears that he does not, he will put it off until after the election, but will certainly try to get it done with the majority needed even if it's 50-50, the vice president of the United States, Vice President Pence, can cast the, deci cast the deciding vote uh, before a new administration comes to power if President Trump is defeated. If President Trump prevails uh, in his bid for re-election uh, here in just a few weeks, uh, then, of course, uh, it will just be a matter of, uh, of time before the, uh, the nominee is, in fact, uh, confirmed. Of course, we're waiting to see who the nominee is. The president has some outstanding young or youngish uh, women jurists from whom to choose. The leading contender at the moment is someone I think extremely highly of, uh, Judge Amy Coney Barrett of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Seventh Circuit, uh, also a professor at Notre Dame uh, Law School. Uh, she happens to be a Catholic, very devout in her faith. Uh, She's not only an outstanding lawyer and judge, she's uh, the, the mother of seven children, including two adopted children from Haiti. Uh, one of her children is a special needs uh, child. So she is a woman uh, with a remarkable uh, background, uh, astonishing achievement. She herself clerked for Justice Scalia and is a sort of protege of the late uh, Justice Scalia, embracing Justice Scalia's principles of textualism and originalism in constitutional interpretation. Uh, if the president makes that nomination, I will certainly be very happy. But there are other uh, women, outstanding women jurists, from whom the president can choose. Robbie, I want to go back to Amy Coney Barrett. Let's talk a little bit more about her. I know um, critics have kind of criticized her in the past, focused on her faith, and suggested that it may influence her judicial decisions, uh, a charge that Coney Barrett has denied. What's your take on this kind of speculation and also these kind of religious attacks? These attacks began when she was up for confirmation in 2017 before the Senate Judiciary Committee for the position she currently holds as a U.S. Court of Appeals judge. The attacks on her faith, Tracy, were shameful. Uh, they were disgusting. Uh, this brought back shades of 1928, the uh, Al Smith campaign, 1960, the anti-Catholicism against uh, John F. Kennedy during that uh, campaign. Uh, one would have thought, hoped we were beyond that kind of anti-religious bigotry in this country. But uh, to their eternal shame, uh, a number of uh, Democratic, uh, progressive United States senators stooped to that kind of disgusting bigotry, and commentators uh, out there um, on the blogs and uh, writing articles and so forth 
engaged in it as well. You would have thought that having broken their spear on Judge Barrett last time they uh, pulled this kind of uh, shenanigans, they would be careful not at least to be public in exhibiting their prejudice. But we're seeing it again already out there on the blogs, in writings, in published articles. And I fear that we're going to see it within the Senate itself. And it is to be nothing but condemned. Well, Robbie, thank you so much for your time today and for your analysis. We really appreciate you speaking with us. Robert George McCormick, professor of jurisprudence and director of the James Madison Program in American Ideals and Institutions at Princeton University. Thank you, as always. Pleasure. Up next, Pope Francis prepares to address world leaders at the UN's annual General Assembly, but this year it's a virtual affair. Well, tonight, EWTN News is debuting its third exclusive poll with Real Clear Opinion Research. A survey was conducted August 27th to September 1st and shows what Catholics think about the impact of the coronavirus. COVID emerged not only as a general issue of concern for Catholics, but one with religious implications. More than 7 in 10 Catholics, 71 percent, said they found it was distressing to be unable to attend Mass during the pandemic. And more than half, 52 percent of all respondents, said they are likely to attend Mass more frequently after the pandemic. Catholics likely voters also found the COVID pandemic to be a thought provoking experience. More than six in 10 said the pandemic made them think differently about their faith. 81% said it had made them think differently about politics and 92% said it had made them think differently about their health. In addition, 79% said the pandemic made them feel closer to God and 93% said it made them feel closer to their families. It is important to note that the survey was taken before the passing of Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. EWTN News and Real Clear Opinion Research will be conducting a fourth and final poll in just a few weeks as we head closer to Election Day. You can see more from the poll and the findings at EWTNNews.com slash poll. The United Nations is celebrating its 75th anniversary this year and among those who are commemorating the event, is Pope Francis. The Holy Father is among those who will deliver recorded remarks as part of a high-level meeting at the General Assembly's opening session. Usually diplomats would fly from all over the world to be together, but because of the coronavirus, the meetings will be virtual. Joining me now is Andrea Galliaducci, Vatican analyst for EWTN News. Andrea, welcome back. So why do you think Pope Francis decided to address the UN tomorrow? Well, it is an important anniversary for the United Nations. It's the 75th anniversary of the United Nations. Then it's a particular General Assembly because it's the first ever that is conducted online because of the COVID-19 uh, measures. And so the Pope wanted to be present, to be part of this meeting with a special message. It's not the, the only intervention the Holy See will deliver during this General Assembly. There will, be, will also be an intervention by Archbishop Gallagher that is the so-called uh, Vatican Foreign Minister, and another one by the Under Secretary for the Multilateral Issues, that is uh, Francesca De Giovanni. But obviously, all the gazes are set on the Pope Francis message. Do we know what the main topics of his speech will be yet? Well, Pope Francis often pushed the, the multilateralism during this last year. He did that uh, into in the speech at the beginning of the new year to the ambassadors accredited to the Holy See. So there will be likely that the Pope will push for multilateralism, especially in a post-COVID world. He will ask for global solidarity, according to what I know, and he will ask for a world that is more connected and more united now. The message is, after this crisis, we cannot get back worse. We need to get back better than before. And to be better, we have to connect. We have to make global connections all together. In, in a word, fraternity. And fraternity will also be the main topic of the encyclical the Pope is going to release on October the 4th. Andrea, what are the greatest challenges for the Holy See at the UN? 
oh, there are a lot of big challenges. One of the biggest challenges, although almost invisible sometimes, is the challenge to counter the uh, sexual gender issues, uh, sexual uh, gender ideologies that often are hidden into the documents. So if we check, we scroll all the Holy See interventions, especially during negotiations, we see in a lot of cases that the Holy See intervenes not to include the gender-oriented paragraphs into statements that would have never to do with that. For example, when the Holy See was negotiating the Global Compact on Migration, there were a lot of interventions of that. And actually, one of the main challenges will be that especially now that we're celebrating the 20th anniversary of the Beijing Conference, uh, 25th anniversary of the Beijing Conference, and there will be a special session at UN, and the Holy See will deliver an intervention, and they will likely push again, push forward the right to life from the conceived person to the natural death. Well, Andrea, thank you so much for your time today. We always appreciate Andrea Galliaducci, Vatican analyst for EWTN News. Thank you again. Thank you for having me. And finally tonight, Pope Francis says God gives his grace always, even when we don't deserve it. Questo è grazia, così è Dio. At the Holy Father's Sunday address, he says God isn't looking for time and results, but rather an open and generous heart. We are called to always go out and share Jesus Christ with others, despite the dangers. But when we don't, we become sick as a church and community. We thank you for watching tonight. For the entire EWTN News Nightly team, I'm Tracy Sable. Good night and God bless.